Hey, welcome to Physics Made Easy. Capacitors are very important components present in most of electric and electronic circuits today. That's nice to know, right? But what is it? What is a capacitor? What does it do? How does it work? Let's find out together. A capacitor is an electric circuit component that consists in two conducting plates separated by a layer of insulating material. Electric charges can be packed on the conducting plates. When this happens, we say that the capacitor is being charged. To pack the charges like this, something needs to do work on these charges. A battery, for example, can do the job. Remember that work is a transfer of energy. So the charges stacked on the plates of the capacitor carry the energy that was provided to put them there. In other words, when a capacitor stores charges, it also stores electrical energy. What is super useful with this is that a capacitor can re-deliver this energy elsewhere in the circuit at a controlled rate. The fact that the rate of discharge can be controlled leads to some major applications we are going to talk about right now. Setting the circuit parameters, such as the capacitor can re-deliver the energy very fast, leads to applications that require a lot of power for a short amount of time. Examples? Camera flashes and defibrillators. Setting the circuit parameters, such as the capacitor delivers the energy very slowly, leads to applications where the voltage needs to be flattened. The voltage of an AC source is a sine curve, like a wave. By choosing carefully some circuit parameters, the output of the circuit containing a capacitor can become a constant voltage. In other words, a DC source. That is what is meant when we say that capacitors can flatten electrical signals. Actually, you are using this every day when charging your phone. You are plugging a transformer in an AC socket that delivers a voltage that evolves with time like a sine curve. That transformer transforms the voltage wave into the constant value that your phone needs. Capacitors can do other things also. How well an alternative current passes through a capacitor depends on the frequency of that current. That leads to another useful application, filtering electrical signals based on their frequency. In audio and music production, we use a lot of low-pass and high-pass filters, and these involve capacitors. For example, a high-pass filter will cut low frequencies like this. A low-pass filter will cut high frequencies like that. So you see, capacitors have a huge role in treating electrical signals, like for example in music production. Yeah, I gave you this example because I'm a music producer. In this video, we will not go into the details of these applications, but I will give you what you need to grasp the fundamental understanding of the behavior of a capacitor in a circuit. You can see this introduction like a starting point in line with the spirit of the Physics Made Easy channel. If you understand well the fundamentals, it becomes easy to fly with your own wings when learning the more detailed stuff. Before we start looking at the behavior of a capacitor within a circuit, ask yourself this. Do you truly know what an electric potential is? If you do, you should be able to define it precisely in one single sentence. If not, I highly recommend you check this video. It is essential for the understanding of what's to come. An electric potential at a given position is the amount of energy that a charge of 1 coulomb would carry if placed at that position. The electric potential is not the property of a thing, but the property of a position. A voltage is a difference in electric potential between two positions. 
having a voltage between A and B, say, of plus 9 volts, means that there is an extra 9 joules of energy carried by each coulomb of positive charge placed at B compared to A. To fully grasp how capacitors work, you will also need to understand the concept of electric fields. Look at this video if electric fields are not clear for you. An electric field is a region of space where an electric charge placed in that region experiences a force. Now let's look at what a capacitor does when part of an electric circuit. We'll use this circuit to illustrate our discussion. As you can see, there are three branches to this circuit. To the left, there is a battery delivering a voltage of epsilon volts. This means that one coulomb of charge located at the positive terminal carries an excess of epsilon joules of energy compared to one coulomb of charge located at the negative terminal. The middle branch is a capacitor C and a resistor R connected in series. The right branch is just a conducting cable. The three branches are connected to a flip switch that can be switched either on A, which will exclude the right branch from the circuit, or on B, which will exclude the battery from the circuit. Time zero is the instant when I flip the switch on A. The positive terminal of the battery, where there is a potential of epsilon volts, is connected to a plate of the capacitor where the potential is zero volts. The circuit is now out of balance. Charges begin to flow from the battery towards the capacitor's upper plate. Now, there is a current flowing in the circuit. Yes, but maybe you spotted a problem here. I told you that between the plates of a capacitor, there is a layer of insulating material. This layer should prevent charges to move through it. An electric current shouldn't be able to flow in the circuit. Yet, current does flow. Let's figure out what's going on by zooming on the capacitor. Imagine an initial positive charge arriving on the upper plate. The charge, like any electric charge, creates an electric field that extends around it. The positive charges on the lower plate will feel a repelling force due to that electric field and be pushed away from the plate towards the negative side of the battery. That's how current can flow through an insulator as long as the thickness of the insulator is not too large. This insulating material is called a dielectric. Its electronic structure impacts the electric field perceived by the low plate and therefore affects some of the capacitor's behaviors and properties. We might look into this in a future video. For now, let's go back to the circuit. At the instant we flip the switch on A, there are still no charges on the capacitor's plate. Yeah, they haven't arrived yet. So the voltage across the capacitor is still zero, and we have an initial current that establishes in the circuit. By using the second law of Kirchhoff that states that the sum of voltages in the loop is zero, we realize that the potential drop across the resistor is the same as the battery, epsilon. So the initial current in the circuit is therefore epsilon over R. Now, Let's look a tiny amount of time after that, at time t1. A few positive charges have arrived on the upper plate of the capacitor. The potential on that plate is therefore positive. As we have seen before, the charges on the upper plate generate an electric field that pushes away the positive charges located on the lower plate. Consequence, there is a deficit of positive charges on the lower plate now. The lower plate is charged negatively and there is a difference of charge density between the plate. Therefore, there is a potential drop across the capacitor. We will call this potential drop Vc. Vc is not zero anymore. By applying the second law of Kirchhoff, Vr is equal to epsilon minus Vc. The potential drop across a resistor has decreased. That means that the current I equals Vr over R has decreased also compared to time zero. In other words, the charges on the positive side of the battery are still inclined to move to the upper plate of the capacitor, but not as much as before. These charges are pushed by the battery, but also a little repelled by the charges already present on the capacitor's upper plate. That is why the current is smaller. Let's move forward in time to time two. The amount of charges on the capacitor's plate increases. Therefore, Vc increases. That means that Vr decreases, and that the current decreases also. 
Let's continue moving in time. At time 3, the density of the charges on the capacitor's plate is such that the voltage across the capacitor is the same as that of the battery, Vc equals epsilon. All points of the circuit connected by a conducting material are at the same potential. The circuit is in balance. If we apply Kirchhoff's second law, Vc being equal to epsilon, that means that Vr must be equal to zero. If Vr is zero, that means that no current is flowing in the circuit anymore. If there is no current flowing in the circuit anymore, that means that the capacitor is not being charged. Yes, because it is already fully charged. Now that we have gone through the whole charging cycle, let's have a quick look at the evolution of some of the circuit's parameters in time. Vc is a potential drop across a capacitor. Q is the amount of charge located in the capacitor. And I is a current in the circuit which is also Vr over R. Note that Q and V evolve exactly the same way. Q and V are actually proportional. The proportionality constant here is called the capacitance of the capacitor. We'll discuss this in a future video. Look also at the current. Look how it decreases as the capacitor charges. Note also that these are exponential curves. We'll have a chance to discuss this in another video in the future. Let's stop for a while by disconnecting the battery and leaving the switch unconnected between A and B. We have now a fully charged capacitor with a voltage across it of epsilon volts. That means that one Coulomb positive charge on the upper plate carries epsilon joules more energy than one Coulomb of positive charge on the lower plate. This is because charges are densely packed on the upper plate and are scarce on the lower plate. What do you think will happen when we flip the switch to position B? This will connect the positively charged plate of the capacitor to the negatively charged plate, with the resistor R in between. At the moment the circuit is closed, charges will flow from the upper plate to the lower plate of the capacitor while passing through the resistor. Current flows. According to the second law of Kirchhoff, the potential drop through the resistor will always be equal to the voltage across a capacitor. Vr equals Vc. Initially, Vc was epsilon. Therefore, initially, Vr is epsilon. Current is flowing, so the positive charges are moving away from the upper plate. The amount of charge packed in the capacitor decreases readily, and therefore so does its voltage. Consequently, because Vr equals Vc, the voltage of the resistor will decrease too, and so will the current, I equals Vr over R. We say here that the capacitor is discharging. After some time, the capacitor is completely discharged, therefore Vc equals zero, thus Vi equals zero, and the current flowing through the circuit is also zero. So you see, this is how a capacitor works. Charges are packed on the upper plate. Work is needed to do so, because it's hard to push this self-repelling little beast together in the same room. This work on the charges is done by the battery and therefore transferred to the charges as electrical potential energy. This potential energy is stored in the capacitor and can be used later in another part of the circuit. Now, why would you not directly connect the battery to the resistor? Well, because a capacitor is not a battery. Its characteristics make it really useful for many applications that a standard battery would not be suited for. A capacitor can provide energy at a rate which is not limited by the kinetics of the chemical reaction in a battery. So you can get a lot of power for a very short amount of time, like in a photo flash, for example. In addition, the charge density on the plates changes during the charging or discharging of a capacitor, and therefore so does the capacitor's voltage. Whereas in a battery, the charge density and voltage stay constant as long as the battery is not depleted, of course. What determines the rate of charge or discharge of a capacitor in a circuit is called a time constant. A time constant is dependent on the resistance of the circuit and the capacitance of the capacitor. The capacitance is the amount of charge that the capacitor can store for each volt across it. We will look at this in more details in a future video. For now, I hope this video has given you a first insight about what a capacitor is, what it can do, and how it works physically. If you enjoyed this introduction to capacitors, please like, subscribe, and smash that notification bell. 
It really helps the channel and encourages me to produce new videos. In the meantime, I wish you the best and I'll see you soon in a future episode of Physics Made Easy. Ciao.